Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. Are you struggling with the dental hygiene shortage and the dialogue out there? And are you wondering, is this ever going to get better? And how can it get better? Well, you're not alone. I think everybody's in the same boat. Today, we bring on one of our favorite guests of all time, Katrina Sanders, and she knows exactly what's going on. And today, she shares the secrets behind the dental hygiene shortages and the challenge within. Make sure you listen to this. I hope you guys enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam. I say that all the time, but you do know the jam. I bring on the world's best experts, thinkers, speakers, coaches, teachers, anywhere in the world to help you create a better practice and better life. And now, today, well, regularly, I have one of my favorites, a great friend of our community here at Act Dental, Katrina Sanders. And I'm just going to say this. If you haven't heard her speak, you're missing out. She's brilliant. She's all over the world now. She's international. You know, Drake is coming to town uh, here in Milwaukee on Friday, and I hear they have 47 semis to create the Drake experience. Katrina doesn't have 47 wow. semis, but she's she's approaching that level of, you know, popularity here in this great profession. And today we're going to be talking about the dental hygiene shortage shortage that you're all experiencing and the challenges within. Katrina? Yes. So good to see you. I, it's so good to see you. You know, I'm laughing because um, <laughs> although I do not travel with 47 semis worth of stuff, if you were to ask my fiance who just finished a trip to Europe with me, he would probably tell you I'm almost close to 47 yeah. semis. Uh, but yes, today we're talking about the baggage, as it were, uh, around dental hygienists, the shortage that we're experiencing, some of the historical pivots that we've seen in dentistry. And I don't know about you, but I, I think we should get a little provocative today about really talking about what's actually going on. You know, let's let's not do the little sugar coating subsurfacey stuff. Let's let's dive into what's really happening here so right. that we can start um, you know, really examining where we go from here inside of the existing pain points. I, I am a practicing dental hygienist and I am a speaker in the dental hygiene realm where I interact with dental hygienists all the time, I, every day from different walks of life, different corners of the country and around the world. And it is unbelievable the universal complications that we're starting to see inside of this. So I'm so excited for this conversation today. I cannot wait. Let's do I, it. I am so pumped also. So, and if you heard that ringing, it was my daughter trying to, I forgot to put on my do not disturb. I oh, don't know if you heard that or not. So, nice. No, I didn't. I didn't. No. Nice. Okay. So you didn't even hear that. So it doesn't even matter. So if you're podcast li listening, don't even worry about that. But uh, it's always interesting. Now, I agree. Let's get a little provocative and let's not throw softballs. Let's actually throw the hardball. So I, and I want to throw good. a couple landmines at you already because I get all these right. all the time. I love this profession and I talk to great, well-meaning dentists all the time. But they're like, man... I just feel like I'm being held hostage for more money and also to this whole signing bonus thing and this culture. And you don't understand my area. There's no hygienist out here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just getting tougher and people don't want to work and all these things that keep coming and coming and coming. So help us decode that. Let's take a look at the big picture because you just did a presentation on this mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. out speaking to dental professionals all over the world. Give us the big picture and the why behind this. Yeah. So, okay, here, here's the big picture inside of what we see in the dental hygiene realm. The first is something that we knew or understood rather even before we entered the pandemic 
And that is, we had a very large population of the baby boomer hygienists. And from a societal trend and, you know, all of the different pieces that we start to see inside of generational pivots, we knew at some point these boomer hygienists were going to retire. Right. Uh, we saw an acceleration of that during the pandemic where the mass exit that people are talking about inside of dental hygiene was really around the boomer population, not all, but a large portion of them saying, well, now's a good time to exit the profession. Now's a good time for me to leave. What happened inside of that, and this is a really important piece, is now we have to look to the hygienists who are currently working, and we need to look to the brand new grads who are coming out of hygiene school. One interesting trend that I still don't understand today is around how dentistry looks at who the employable hygienists are. It seems as though you're not considered a, quote, employable hygienist until you have two years of experience. Mm. Well, that's really hard, right? Because it's like, well, how am I supposed to get experience if nobody's going to hire me because I'm a brand new grad fresh out of hygiene school? And I don't know where that vernacular came from, but one piece I will say first and foremost is we we recognize it we understand that there are challenges around the hygienists who have left the profession but if we're going to focus on who left and ignore the fact that there are hygienists inside of the existing workforce because this is the provocative statement that i've said forward and backward i i had a, a viral post go out pun intended as we're talking about the pandemic but as viral posts go out i posted this a few months ago and i said just a heads up there's no shortage of employable hygienists. We are there. We have the skills. We've gone to hygiene school. We've passed the boards. We have the licensure. We're there. We are licensed and we are ready to work. There's no shortage of hygienists. There's a shortage of appreciation of what hygienists bring. And so inside of that, gosh, it makes it a lot easier if I show up every day and I'm in a toxic environment or I'm being treated like garbage or the skills that I spent all of this time, not just going to school, but getting continuing education credits for, that all of that is being squandered inside of just do what's on the Dentrix appointment book column for today. Well, you know what? Opening that Etsy store where I'm making stickers and bookmarks and making the same amount of money working from home sounds really yummy and juicy right now for me. Right. So I think the interesting dialogue inside of this is that hygienists for a long time have have not um felt the level or layer of importance around the value and worth of what it is they bring to their practice as a hygienist i am consistently told i i will go into practices i see them all the time where their morning huddle begins with here's what katrina produced yesterday and that's a hard pill for me to swallow because what you're doing is you are quantifying this is the value of what you brought to our practice yesterday. Here's how much money you brought in. What you're not talking about is the patient who cried in my arms because she's going through a divorce and she's scared. And she's looking to me, not only as her healthcare provider, but as somebody who cares about her as a human being. What right. you're not taking into consideration, uh, you know, is the patient who uh, maybe did want to start scaling and root planing today, but couldn't because they had to pick up their special needs son from school. And so as a human, instead of you know, driving home the bottom line of the business of the of the practice, I'm treating my patients from a humanistic standpoint. It it really moved into this model where hygienists were seen as, here's how much production you're bringing into the practice, so here's the value of what you bring. And it has created this really toxic narrative where hygienists truly only believe that what they bring to the practice is around money, hence where you start to see the the sign on bonuses and the here's how much I'm going to pay you more than the, you know what I mean? It, it, it really started to create that narrative. And it's interesting because I've asked hygienists, has your doctor ever asked you, what do you need in order to remain happy here in this practice? Right. Right. So let's, is that, is that a question? Right. So that, that's, that's where we have to start changing that narrative. Yeah. I love what I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. 
And I'm just going to, because you said, let's get a little dicey here. Yeah, so let's do it. I'm going to be speaking to the dentist who's listening to this, who says, okay, Katrina, I totally get it, but you don't understand. I give them everything. Like I give them what they want. I pay them what they want. You know, it's a lot of dough. And let's be transparent here. I'm in a PPO environment. I got seven ops. Like my overhead is high. I'm running off a ton. And so I get it. You're saying really connect with my hygienist, get their value. I have no time. Okay. And I also have no money because I'm out running the wolf every month. So, okay. And I, I, you know, you're probably going to talk about check-ins and I don't have time for check-ins only because I don't, the business doesn't allow me for time for check-ins. So now I'm down in this hole and let me add one more complexity because you're going to help us out of this. I'll speak maybe to a male dentist who you can't dig out of this hole yourself. You need a, you need somebody to help because what you're talking about is a reframe. I have to yes. change my brain. And yes. I know for me, like, I don't do that very well. I need someone else to go, okay, listen, come here. Come here. You're not right. seeing this correctly. So I just threw a whole bunch at you. Help me <laughs> decode some of that. Where, where would you even start? Oh my gosh. It, it, so I, I have to tell you this because this just like cracks me up. Um, I remember this was a few years back. I was um, talking to a prospective productivity coach. And I remember, you know, I, I had seen some stuff she did. We did a discovery call and she's like, well, here's what it's going to look like. We'll meet once a week for an hour and we're going to build these processes and we're going to do all these things. And I said to her, I, I don't have time for that. So exactly what I said to her, right? I recognized in that moment that I didn't not have time to do that. So what I was doing was I was saying to her that I was prioritizing the chaos inside of my business instead of saying, I'm going to make the time. Because here's the piece that I think is so important. Um, when we look time and again at how people make decisions, where they make decisions from, what is it people make decisions from a space of emotion and then they justify it with logic? Well, there are two major emotional statuses or stati, I guess you could say, that that we as human beings function inside of. The first is fear and the second is love. That is, that is true forward and backward. You talk to anybody. So we have to start, first of all, thinking, are we making decisions from a space of fear or a space of love? Now, that space of fear happens when you're in a Maslow's hierarchy of need situation where you're like, I just need a body with two hands and a hygiene license to see my patients today. Right. We're in a different scenario here. But what I mean to say is you have a provider or a series of providers who are showing up every day, clocking in, putting on your branded scrubs, representing you, the core values of your practice. They are sitting there. They are the mid-level provider of the practice. They are gathering at a minimum a dental hygiene co-diagnosis. They're taking interoral photos. They're taking radiographs. They are single-handedly maintaining open relationships with the patients who trust you enough to come in every three, four, or six months. And you can't prioritize a chunk of time to sit down with that person and to make sure that they're happy. And here's the thing. You know, doctors will say, you know, I, I'm giving them everything. Well, that's everything to you. Right. What do they want? So here's a really trick example of this. Um, I find as many times as I ask a hygienist, has your doctor ever asked you, or I, not even doctor, just has your practice owner, whomever that may be, has your practice owner asked you, what do you need? Or what, what can I offer you? What are your professional goals? What are your clinical goals? And how can I support that? Are these the conversations you're having? Or is it your doctor's so afraid we're in this fear base where it's like, here's how much more money I'll pay you if you continue to stay. And right. don't go to the practice across the street, right? So the first piece I'll say is the fear brain, the scarcity mindset goes, I don't have any more money to pay these people. I, I'm doing my best. I'm giving them everything. That's the fear, the scarcity mindset. The, the love is this person or these individuals are representing me. They are bringing their clinical excellence every day. One, one major piece that I don't think practice owners fully understand is as much as they are working because they own the practice. And if we close a bunch of, you know, porcelain crowns or cosmetic work or whatever that may be that they as the business owner are going to benefit from the bottom line of what that is. What I don't know if they fully understand is that you also have team members who 
are dying to pee, but don't so that they can bring that next patient back on time. They are starving. Their stomachs are growling in their patient's ears because they are just dying for a handful of almonds. And they're not going to do it because they're going to make sure that they bring your patient back. They are going to wipe down all of the pieces of equipment in the operatory. At the end of the day, they're going to take the trash out. They're going to make sure that their instruments are wiped down. They are going to help you by anesthetizing that patient when you're running behind. Like th these are people who really do care about you, about your patient population, about your practice. So as many times as I ask hygienists, has your doctor or practice owner asked you what you really need or what, what is, what is the, the bottom line of what would continue to make you happy and drive you into the practice? I ask the other side of that, which is doctor, practice owner, what is your hygienist's motivator? Now, I say that because uh, we were hanging out last night, actually, with Ralph Wilson, who I know he's a good buddy of yours, right? Mm -hmm. I love that guy. He's just such a hoot. Well, Ralph knows what my motivator is. He knows that forward and backward. In our practice, we do have, I don't even know what it is. I can't even tell you because I truly don't know what it is. We have some sort of a bonus system. It's like if you help diagnose this and the patients, I don't know. It doesn't even matter. Money is not a motivator for me. Mm -hmm. Clinical excellence, transforming the level of care, knowing at the end of the day that I did the best for my patient, that I had the optimal time to deliver the level of care, the standard of excellence that I want, that I have the autonomy to share with my doctors. Here's a product, here's a device, here's a protocol that I believe will transform standards of excellence in our practice. And I want you to take it seriously and sit down and listen to me and ask me questions and respect me as your colleague inside of this conversation around what we can do to elevate our standard. Oh, that is my, I'm like getting, I'm blushing thinking about it. Like that's my, oh, I love that so much. Yeah. My doctors don't need to pay me more. I don't want more. I'm supposed to track on like a spreadsheet, like my bonus based. On, I, I don't, I don't even know where my spreadsheet is. That's not a driver for me. It is not. And my doctors are super cool with that. Because how amazing that they've taken the time to acknowledge my motivator is clinical excellence. So now, instead of paying me more, now it's Ralph Wilson saying, hey, Katrina, um, this new product came across my desk. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's see if there's a way that we can envision what this may look like inside of our practice with our patients. Do you, do you think that doesn't just like light my little ginger soul up? Like, of course it does. Right. because that's my motivator. So the fear base is, oh, they only want more money and they only want this and they only want that. The love space, I think, really carves open the space to have a conversation about what does this look like? What does your dream practice look like? What does your right. dream job look like? What does your dream patient experience look like? How can I help facilitate that for you? Because here's the thing, when you facilitate that for your hygienist, what you're doing is you are facilitating clinical excellence for your patient population. Does that not matter to a practice owner? Of course it does. 100%. Because clinical excellence gives clinical outcomes and clinical outcomes mean you have a happy patient population and that's marketing you cannot simply cannot pay for. Yeah. And wouldn't you agree as a, let's say I'm Ralph for a second and I know your motivators that goes way beyond pay. You've already said it, but that Huge. becomes a sticky factor in which you like who you are as a result mm -hmm. of going to work in an environment like that. Now, let me, I think you're hitting an important um, pearl here because it's a huge one. It's no different than the first time you did disc. You realize why right. people did what they did. If you're married or dating anyone, you know, the five love languages this is like critical because it helps you understand how the other person feels loved. If you yes. do um, working geniuses or any other type of thing here at Act Dental, we do what are called user manuals, which People write their own user mail. I'm best communicated this way. This is what's important to me. And so it's actually quite funny to watch it, but you learn so much about the human behind the yeah. role. And so it's something we are always trying to look at and grow. But I think you as a dentist, if you're listening, you've got to be invested in who these people are and what motivates them. That's what you're saying, correct? Yes, absolutely. And, and I think the important other side of that is, are you a magnet attracting people 
in which their motivator or their their core values are perhaps not in alignment with what you want. So it's something like this. Um, you know, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So if it's one thing if you have a hygienist or a hygiene team in your practice, uh, first of all, those are people who are continuing to say perhaps no to other job opportunities that may be coming along. I, I haven't looked for a job in forever. I love what I do. I love where I work. I love who I work with. But let's be real, like I get offers. I get plenty of offers for a lot more than I'm making right now. That's just not my motivator because right. I know nobody can deliver excellence the way my doctors can. And I love that, right? But they've created a magnet for that. They've created this space where they are attracting people team members who want clinical excellence. So let's look at the other side of this. Let's say you don't have a hygienist or a hygiene team and you're putting ads out there because you want to bring in a hygienist or hygiene team into your practice and nobody nobody in my town wants to work and you don't understand. Well, take a look at what bait you're putting on that fishing hook before you're throwing it out there, right? right. Because if you're saying things like, first of all, take the word rock star out of your title <laughs> because I that is like... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like I, as a hygienist, the moment you put rock star in there, I'm like, they no. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm skipping and moving on to the next ad. Like I wouldn't even look at that. Right. Um, but if you're saying things like we pay the top amount of money, um, we give bonuses, what you're going to attract is a hygienist in which money is their motivator. So there's where that that fear base or that's if if you're a practice where you can't pay top dollar, you know you you can't just throw a ten thousand dollar sign on bonus or whatever that might be for a high, if you can't do that, well look at what you can what can you offer what can right. you offer to a hygienist are are you a, a practice where you as the doctor are going to support your hygienist when they sit down and they say I'm concerned about this area and I want Dr Jones to come in and take a look at this and see Dr Jones come on in and Dr Jones says wow Katrina that was thank you so much for pointing that out Katrina that was excellent uh, that may be a terrific motivator for somebody do you offer continuing dental education as a team do you you know create um, opportunities for your hygiene team to to select the products, the equipment, the protocols that they're using, you know, what type of, of an experience is a clinician going to have inside of your practice? And I will say, if you can't think of anything that gets you excited to write about in an ad, then I think we've found the problem. Right. You know what I mean? I, yep. I promised we were going to get provocative here. <laughs> <laughs> I so love there it. it is, right? <laughs> there it is. Start getting creative. Think about other ways to help people. Here's a really terrific example. A few years back, AZ Perio, um, you know, did something where they they recognized like we we want to love our clinicians, we want to love our team. So now I get my birthday as a PTO day, an extra PTO day. I get to spend my birthday doing whatever I want. Well, you know what? I love where I work. So if I'm scheduled for, you know, patient care that day, I'm coming in because they're going to, you know, buy lunch and spoil me and all that stuff. But I I, I get to use that extra PTO day at some point in March because my birthday is in March. Very cool. Right? That like there are ways that you can still love your team and show them. There are ways that you can create a beautiful culture and an environment. But if you can't write about something that you're excited about that makes people get excited to potentially be a member of your team, then we've got some work to do in what that culture looks like in your practice, what you are offering to a team to help them understand the value and worth of what it is they bring to your organization. Yeah. I love what you're saying. And and ultimately, I mean, you can't look for shortcuts in any business. Long term, if you're a young dentist, if you're in dental school listening to this, hear me out. Your goal is to build an amazing culture where you care, you have values, you develop people, you get to learn about people. Uh, there's rules for behavior. You give great feedback. You're invested in their growth. You give people a clear line of sight on how they can grow and develop. And you're really into the people and my friend, if you're listening to that and you do that, you're going to have 30 to 40 years of a lot of fun, even when right. the market has very little to offer. You will attract the best talent. And when you attract that best talent, they'll go to their friends, go, come on over here. This is a great place to work. That's right. If you shortcut that and say, no, I got to find a way to grow production and scale and get to a second location and build some more ops and make some more money. 
that's not bad, but that's you're starting with that and you're left with the wreckage that comes with that being your focus, which means you deal with those other things. Now, I uh, I want you to go further because this is you're the expert here, but you're just hitting the hot button with me. Let's talk more about the shortage. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Katrina, help me out of this. But like, there is a shortage in my area. And what do I do? Like, where do I even start? So, so Mm -hmm. I'm hearing what you're saying. Help me out of this. Like, give me some basics. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's dial it back. There are four major reasons, barriers, challenges, or pain points that nearly every hygienist definitely in the country, I'm, I won't say around the world, but I'll say at a minimum in the country, will say or call out as major pain points or challenges that interrupt them or get in the way of them being able to do the level of care they want to. So my my first, and we'll go over those, but my first inclination or thought, if I'm a practice owner, doctor, and I want to either attract a hygienist or I want my hygienist to be happier, I'm going to look at these four things and I'm going to think, what are ways that I can, you know, really trap or corral those four pain points into different segments so that I can start addressing how those things are showing up for my hygienist? If I can solve those four major barriers, then I am a delightful, wonderful, joyful place to work. And I'm going to be able to be a wonderful attractant for future clinicians to want to come and work with me. So, Those four barriers, and we'll go through each one just to kind of dive into this a little bit. Uh, Those four barriers are time, fear, lack of support, and cost. Okay, so Mm -hmm. let's talk about fear, uh, time first. Time is a a big one. Now, for practice, I want you to start thinking for practices where it's I I I don't know. I mean, this this is as much as I can pay my hygienist. Can we get creative with time? So <clears throat> this was interesting. There's a research study that was done by the American Dental Hygienists Association that looked at how often dental hygienists take and record blood pressure readings on their patients. And in this research study, the most frequent reason why dental hygienists do not take blood pressure and record, which by the way, this is you know, starting to become a pretty standardized protocol in dental practices across the United States. The most frequently cited reason why hygienists do not do this is because of insufficient time and minimal value given to this procedure by their employers. Okay. So doctors, right? Well, let's put the doctor hat on. Let's put the practice owner hat on. I'm giving them everything they want. I bought them the, the little cuff, wrist cuff thing. I, I, I don't know what else they want. Well, we might need more time. Or if we're do- doing the blood pressure in our operatories and you're next door delivering anesthetic on patients and you're not taking blood pressure, that creates a very strong conversation around where you place your value or rather you don't right. value that. I want to work with a doctor who has the same value system I do. I want to work with a doctor that treats patients with the same level or standard of of care and excellence that I believe I should be delivering when I'm showing up as an employee of this practice. So if I care so much that I'm doing this and my doctor next door hasn't even built out a protocol or a standard around how to do that in their operatory, I'm already thinking our value systems are off. Now we have to look at time. Right. And I think the the limiting um, issues inside of this is dental hygienists are expected for the most part to corral the level of work no matter what the challenges are with the patient. Now, we can, we have outliers. There are some patients that'll have a little pop-up that'll say, give this patient 90 minutes instead of a 60-minute appointment or whatever that might be. But those are extremely rare. I'm talking about the, hy- the hygiene patients who come in that are consistently extremely sensitive. And so the hygienist has to use injectables just for routine hygiene visits. I'm talking about the patients who are due for a full mouth series of x-rays, which provocative statement, but I'm just going to say it, it takes longer to take a full mouth series of x-rays than it does the routine four bite wings. So we need more time. We need help. And so inside of this, it's, well, I'm giving them everything. Do you know that? Do you know that you've given them everything? Because 
they're they are tripping on sensor cords just trying to hurry up and take those x-rays they're cutting corners as much as they can to find these magic minutes they're not peeing they're not eating in between patients they are just trying to get through their clinical day they're missing things in their clinical notes because they're trying to hurry up and rush through patients perhaps looking at that limit of time and saying i can't pay you more but I'm open to restructuring what our schedule looks like so that you are not expected to treat every patient on the same average standard, but rather I want to be able to give you autonomy to decide how long will it take you to deliver this level of care? Yeah. What does that do, right? That changes so the conversation. It gives the, the hygienist, because uh, I've done this in one practice. One doctor came up to me and said, hey, your schedule's off. Um, do you want to fix it? Do you want to dictate what you want? So when he said that to me, now I, I, I recognize I'm one of those, like, if you give me an inch, I will take seven miles. Like I'm great. Thank you. So I built out my entire schedule where I had the scaling and root planing chunks. I had re-evaluation chunks from those scaling and root planings where I was delivering local delivery of antibiotic fluoride varnishes. Or if I wasn't doing a re-eval, I was doing adult sealants in that 30 minute slot. You know, I mean, I created a scaffolding for a day that looked and felt good for me, even based on the fact that in the afternoon, I don't want to do SRPs. I want my afternoon to be easy peasy. I just want to do perio maintenance. So I built out my day based on what made sense and made me feel good. I had a stronger level of ownership and accountability inside of my practice. Right. That didn't cost my doctor any money. And in fact, because I was able to schedule this way and I had those holes in those pockets with my lens, my over the balcony view of what my patients needed, my doctor was more productive. Right. And Katrina, you're talking about a very high level of emotional intelligence, which also right. requires some intelligence on your business model. What Katrina is saying right. is absolutely true. And it requires vision at the top. So if you're a dentist, I don't know how to say this, but the less you're collecting your full fee regularly, the less control you have of any time, which means you're, That's right. you know, as write offs increase and get into the 40% range, Let's just call that out. You might want to do this, but you have zero control. And I, I hear this stuff all the time. Like, I think I want to move to 30 minutes for each one of my hygienists. And I'm like, oh my oh. gosh, you should just try that. <laughs> like, you should try yeah, it yourself and mm -hmm. see how fast you hate it. So, because, um, so, you know, I think time is the new rich. And so when you yes. start to really control where your business goes, which means you're collecting more of your full fee for anything, you can allocate more time, which is critical to nurturing mm -hmm. relationships. There's a, there's kind of this quotient, the amount of time and you give to a relationship and how healthy it can be. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going off the rails here, but like, I think it's important as you go through these to have some big perspective on this. What's number two? Give us number Absolutely. two. So number two is fear. And fear also pours a bit into uh, lack of support in a way. So hygienists have fears. And I, so I'll, I'll, I'll glob those together just because they they really do. They're one kind of feeds into the other. Um, I, I was just at uh, a large dental hygiene conference over the weekend. And this is a conference where the hygienists there are notoriously the the you know uh, first line of uh, early adopters. They are the ones who are advocates for themselves. They are not the hygienists that sit around and wait for their doctor to pay for their course admission to go to this conference. Like that, that is not what you typically get from this conference. So these are your forward thinkers. These are the hygienists that are that are there because they really want this high level education. And this this conference that I was uh, presenting at is not a, a I mean, it, it was in Nashville, but it's not a party conference. Like we, we've got high level clinical speakers talking on high level clinical content. So the fear that I heard on the trade show floor was, well, that's really great, but my doctor would never. Well, that's great, but my I, that's that's too much for my doc. My it, no, they 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 wouldn't even. No, I, I I mean, I'll bring it back, but they won't. You know what I'm saying? So okay, when you hear that, where's the fear inside of that? That I'm spending all of this time elevating my education and learning about the newest and the latest and great. We did a new product presentation where rapid fire every ten minutes the newest products to hit the hygiene 
you know, storefront for lack of a better term, all of the different ways, the accoutrements as it were, as to how we could help improve our level of care. All of that was presented there. And yet inside of that, you heard hygienists already saying, uh, my doctor won't. So we're having an interesting conversation battle here where doctors are saying, I'm giving them everything. And actually what I hear are the hygienists saying, even if I wanted to, they, they won't, right. they won't. So there's that fear there. The other layer is that lack of support. Um, think about what happens when your hygienist says, I believe that you have stage two periodontitis and I'm concerned and let's talk about scaling and root planing. And then doctor comes in, does the exam and says, yep, everything looks great. And then leaves. That's not support. No. You didn't support what was going on. What you did was you negated the fact that I just spent the past 45 minutes talking to my patient about gum disease and trying to close this case. Or what about the front desk team who comes back and says there aren't enough five millimeter pocket depths on this period chart. So you can't do SRPs on this patient with all due respect. I need the support. I need the front office team to be supporting, backing me when I make this clinical decision. Now you're telling me that the levels of my skills are going to be whittled down to what's going to be the most convenient for a front office team member to invoice to a third party payer. That lack of support, that fear mongering, like all of that has really created a very corroded layer, again, around hygienists truly believing all I bring to the practice is as long as I'm not a prima donna, as long as I don't rock the boat, as long as I don't tell the patient, I know you thought you were here for your free cleaning, but you really need more because I know that's going to inconvenience the front desk who now has to print out something from Dentrix and put it in a little folder and sit with the patient in the little room and talk about scaling. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we get in this space where it's like we, the processes aren't built out to support us. Right. The processes are not built out. And so here we are inside of this framework of, so what happens when I, I'm 35 minutes into my profi appointment, and now finally we've agreed that scaling and root planing is going to be an option for that. Pay Are you going to expect me to do two quads of scaling and root planing in the remaining 25 minutes I have to finish treating that patient, give post-operative instructions, dismiss the patient, wipe down the operatory, and get ready for the next patient? So we, we need to have those processes built out. We need to have that support. And our fears need to have a space to be heard. Right. Yeah, I think that's the next opportunity. And again, what, you know, doctors, I, I'm giving them everything. Again, it's it is. Are there whispers of things that your hygiene team needs or wants in order? We're talking about them being successful in delivering patient care. I'm not even talking about. Does your hygienist need a, a break to just take a deep breath and grab a sip of water? I'm right. not even talking about that. I'm just talking about how do your patients receive care from your hygiene team. Yeah. And you might be thinking enough if you're listening to this as a reactionary measure that people aren't happy. So I got to step into this, but let's take a look at it from a proactive nature. Again, speaking to the young dentist, you know, start out of the gate with a clinical calibration philosophy of how we take care of patients. What really, right. what is periodontal disease? And we're all calibrated on that. We're aligned on it. How do we discuss it? Like, how do we some doctors that are listening to this, they have regular calibrations with their team. It's not a me versus you. It's us together trying to get aligned to say the same thing, think the same thing. And I'll even say your course, which we'll mention in a little bit. People always ask me, should I just send my hygienist? I'm like, you should go with oh. them. You have to sit next. <laughs> I don't know if I have time. You, you have to sit next to them because what they're going to experience is their mind is going to be blown and I love the yeah. whispers when you can see the yeah. hygienist talking to the doctor going, What's and they're both nodding uh -huh. like, that's great uh -huh. that we heard it together in the same room, right. the same way. Right. Those are just yeah. little nuggets. Am I on the right path here of how- You're on the right path, yes. How you come yes. together long-term. That is absolutely it, which I think pours into the final piece of this, which is around- cost. Okay. Um, cost is a barrier that dental hygienists say gets in the way of them being excellent inside of clinical care. And one of those pieces really is focused on the limiting belief that patients are driven by cost. Doctors are driven by cost. 
that the only way that I'm going to create value inside of my practice is if I bring in a lot of money. So it's really this fear around what money actually brings to or creates inside of a dental practice. Now, it was interesting. There was a research study that was done several years ago that actually looked at that, looked at what the driver or the motivator is for patients in a dental operatory. Really? When they did this research study, yeah, it was really interesting. They took these, the, these patients that all had uh, one thing in common. Uh, all of these patients in this survey, in the study, uh, were diagnosed with active periodontitis and treatment plan for scaling and root planing. And every single one of these patients declined their treatment plan. So the you know, uh, examiner of the study wanted to know why. Why did you decline the treatment plan? Is it because, you know, you were afraid of the needle? Is it because you wanted to get a second opinion? Is it because of the money, the cost, the insurance coverage, et cetera? And of course, the number one answer that most dental practitioners will say, if I ask them, what do you think it is? Most dental practitioners will say, oh, it's obviously, the, it's the money, it's the cost. Well, the important lesson inside of this is the number one reason why patients actually decline their treatment plans in this survey is because they didn't trust their dental health care practitioner. And that trust is a really important layer. So when you talk about calibrating, like you just said, that, that calibration is so important because it gives us an opportunity to learn to speak the same language. It allows us to develop a choreographed dance as to how the doctor comes in and sits down. Every single time that I as a dental hygienist need to get up and leave the room, de-glove because I don't have something on my tray, the patient's trust is wavering. Every single time that it's like, oh, I need the sensor. Oh, there's no sensor that I can use because all the sensors are being used. Well, I'm just going to move forward with treating my patient even though I don't have x-rays on them because I'm waiting. That is wavering inside of the level of trust that our patients have in us. Inside of that cost piece, what starts happening is it's almost like... Um, you know, uh, one of uh, one of my things that I say to to my fiance all the time is, "You're too you're too cheap to buy inexpensive things, <laughs> right?" That that concept because because he is he's a cheese cheap, uh, you know. But it's that's an important lesson. You know, are we focusing on the wrong thing? Are we working so hard to penny pinch or focus on cost when the focus really should be on? What is it that we're doing to invest in building levels of trust in our patients? Because patients who trust you will say yes. Patients who trust you will look to you to help them get the level of health they need. The prevalence of disease alone tells us that patients are walking in and out of every dental practice across the United States in some level of disease, whether they have oral inflammation, whether that inflammation is reversible or irreversible, whether they have uh, decay, risk for decay, oral cancer, risk for oral cancer, risk for HPV, airway complicated issues, whatever is going on, like the vast majority of patients who are coming in to see your preventive department already has some layers of disease or at a minimum has a risk factor and your dental hygienist has the answer for how to address that level of disease. If we are focusing on penny pinching and finding the cheapest option instead of focusing on what do we do to continue building trust, to create a similar narrative so that we're using similar language so that we're able to support our patients in creating a very similar conversation inside of the patient experience. What hygienist do you need for us to create a streamlined patient experience so that we can lift that patient trust in our practice and look at the bottom line of our practice, not from a space of fear, but from a space of love? Boom. That becomes, Drop the mic. That, I mean, boom, right? It so I think that just, becomes the important narrative. Absolutely. And patient trust, let's go bigger than that. Your brand, the number one component of your brand in the future, again, speaking to the young dentist, is trust. Your number one game in building a team is trust. If you ever have a family, you know that's the number one currency you have to create because when the trust is gone, so is everything else. And so that's right. I think you're speaking to some very, very important things. And I have like 13 more questions. And I also know I can't keep you for another hour here. I know. So uh, here, here's, here's what I want to do. I'm having you back again and again and again. We're going to cover all these things, but uh, we're going to talk. I want to talk about your course. I want to talk about yes. what you're doing on social media, your wine, and then speaking. But before we do that, let's do this. I want you to give us, wrap this in a bow. 
Give us your final thoughts on the dental hygiene shortage and the challenges within. Here's the bow that I will share. Uh, right now in Colorado, there are some statutes that are coming out to start addressing the dental hygienist shortage. The reason why they are addressing this dental hygiene shortage is because of two major reasons. One, the shortage of dental hygienists available, and number two, the skyrocketing requests for salaries. So inside of this provision, 3223, in the state of Colorado, they are now moving to a model of trying to train dental assistants to learn how to scale patients. Dental hygienists are now feeling like the level of care that they are providing has been whittled down to being a tooth scraper. And the important piece that I want dentists, practice owners to know inside of this current model right now is the fact that when I posted about this on social media and dental hygienists responded with what their fears and their concerns were, their fears and their concerns were not about, oh, so now somebody's going to come in and do it cheaper or, you know, uh, oh, I'm going to uh, have my, my job security is at risk. That was not their concern. Every dental hygienist who commented, and you're more than welcome to check out my Instagram, every dental hygienist who commented said, I am concerned about what this means for the oral health and systemic health of my patients and my community. I encourage you to consider that dental hygienists went to dental hygiene school because we really do want to help people. We really care about the health of our patients and we want to be a partner alongside the practice owner. So for practice owners who are trying to figure out how do I do this, change that mindset from a right. fear based to a love, knowing that we want to stand alongside you. So well said. All right. So mm -hmm. coming up here in the fall, if you're mm -hmm. looking for an opportunity to bring your hygienist and get aligned and energized and possibly drink some wine, tell us about what they're going to experience. I, I will tell you, this has been one of the game changers for us. We stopped trying to figure all this out and we just invited the rock star in and her name's Katrina <laughs> Sanders. And I sit through <laughs> these things and my mind's blown. I'm like, number one. I've never heard it said like that. Number two, you've got the research. Number three, you've got the mm -hmm. clinical understanding. There's so much empathy and understand. Like, um, tell us what they're going to experience if you come to the course. Now, if you're not taking notes, don't worry. This is how it works. We take notes for you. So flip up to the notes and Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify. You're going to see a link to Katrina's course. What are we going to experience if we come to that course? Oh, I love it. So this course is amazing. We presented it. In fact, we sold out. So we're doing a, an encore. Uh, and in fact, I don't know if you know this, but people who came to the uh, you know original iteration are saying they just want to come back every year to hear it again, to kind of revitalize and start to look at things that are happening inside of their clinical practice. So we've got some amazing feedback from it. This is a uh, all clinical team effort where we're going to be really deep diving and unpacking what we understand around the provision of prevention in the hygiene column, uh, as well as periodontal classifications, looking at what our existing protocols are and workshopping what each practice wants to do from a, here's the evidence-based research and here's how we want to pragmatically and practically apply this inside of our protocols. So that by the end of the weekend, you're walking back into your clinical practice Monday morning with a list of tasks assigned to people that indicate, here's what we're going to do to start implementing these strategies. Again, it's been incredible. It's been a game changer for the attendees who have already been there, who quite frankly, want to come back and just soak up all of it again, which is so exciting to, to know that this is reaching dentistry in a space where doctors and hygienists are coming together and having a collective conversation. I love it. It always sells out. I mean, you're it not does. Drake yet, but there'll be not some eyes. <laughs> I, whenever we have a Katrina course, it's like, why are all these people here? Oh, it's Katrina. She's here, you know? So um, it's a, it's remarkable. <laughs> life-changing, practice-changing, uh, you have to check it out. And again, there'll be links in there. I also want you to follow her on, on Instagram. She is truly one of the best in social media. You are so creative. And we're going to list oh, all of her you. social media down in there. She's also a wine producer. So right. tell That's us right. about your wines. Come on, yeah, give us so a little insight. 
We've got we've got a line of wines. Uh, our line of wines were uh, designed alongside myself and our winemaker, and these wines are uh, really designed to not only be good, delicious, yummy wines that dentistry loves, but we also give back to nonprofit organizations as a component of our wine sales. Um, we do pause them during the summer months. I'm in Phoenix, and our wine comes from Arizona, so we do pause during the winter months so that the wine doesn't spoil. Uh, that's my dedication to the wine community that we deliver excellent wine that does not have uh, you know preservatives in it give you headaches things like that um, these are high quality wines coming from a sommelier um, and we are so excited to be pouring them at the act dental event this fall so uh, if you want to experience some beautiful wines and some great education come join us in milwaukee and i promise you you will experience my wines there you will love them. And again, we'll put a link to our wines in the show notes. So check them out. Also, if you're a study club director and you haven't had Katrina speak to your study club, what in the world are you thinking? She will blow everyone's <laughs> minds. It is awesome. A wonderful, wonderful day that you'll just provide a ton of value to all those people you care for. So make sure you check it out. So Katrina, thank you as always for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, Kirk. Oh my gosh, pleasure is all mine. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. I'm loving this. If you keep showing up, we'll keep bringing it. I'm going to have Katrina back again and again and again and again and again and again. And other great minds in dentistry. And each time, our goal is to give you great information from great thinkers to help you create a better practice and a better life. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.